Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our next session, and I am delighted to introduce our next speaker, who is Craig O'Connor with the Office of Renewable Energy and Environmental Exports with the U.S. Import-Export Bank. This is a really important piece of how the U.S. government assists businesses, American businesses, in terms of really building their markets and, and really deploying technology around the world. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. I'm going to talk very rapidly about Exxon Bank, so I'll give you a quick overview of, a, of our programs, and more importantly and interestingly for you, some of the deals that we've financed. I see my colleagues from the Department of Energy in the back. Um, so, and I'll try to allow time for, for a couple of questions. So, actually, it's the Export Import Bank of the United States, and uh, we were started in 1934. We're located on Vermont Avenue, and um, basically set up in 34 during the height of the Great Depression to provide financing when financing was scarce. It was challenging. Um, obviously, there's many markets uh, that lack the financing necessary to rebuild and buy U.S.-made goods and services. So originally, we were set up to provide some import financing, but we had dispensed with that early in our years, but never bothered to change our name. So we only finance the export of U.S.-made goods and services. Ownership dust doesn't matter. I'll tell you about Gamesa, builds U.S. turbines, wind turbines in Pennsylvania. We finance the export of those. So Exxon Banks had an interesting history. Uh, we financed the Pan American Highway, the Burma Road during World War II, some of the first steel mills, the rebuilding of Western Europe. Um, so our basic mission, again, is to finance the export of U.S. made goods and services. We do look for a reasonable assurance of repayment. And so we're, I, I like to tell people we're not in business to make money, but we're not in business to lose money either. Uh, we're a congressionally chartered organization, so every four or five years or so we get a new charter from the U.S. Congress. Um, the reason I'm in my current job, I've been at the bank over 20 years, started life as a loan officer there. Uh, I was t talked into being the bank's uh, environmental liaison officer back in 94 as a part-time job, and uh, now it's a full-time job for me and five other people as of 2009. And so uh, the, the sense to increase our support for environmentally beneficial exports was actually written into our congressional charter. And so increasing our support for renewable energy is a congressional mandate, but it's also a top priority for the administration. Um, so how do we do that? Well, uh, first we provide direct loans, and that's very critical, particularly in uh, times of financial turbulence. And so for renewable energy, Exxon Bank is able to offer repayment terms of up to 18 years. Um, that's a long time. And as, as my esteemed speakers, Scott Scalar and Carl Gaywell mentioned, with renewable energy, you're buying your fuel up front. And I, I tell the international customers, you know what, you've got a 20 to 25 year fuel price hedge. I was at a, at a meeting on uh, Vietnam wind developers, a lot of government officials on, on Monday at the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, another agency you should get to know. And um, I always do that, ask for a show of hands, how many people think uh, the price of oil and gas will be lower in 10 years? Nobody? No, no bulls on, yeah. Well, you heard from our friends in solar, so it's obviously the price of solar and wind are going to go down. But notwithstanding that, if you got your energy costs locked in for the next 20, 25 years, that's a heck of a fuel price edge. Particularly if you're a Caribbean island like Barbados and you're importing diesel and your costs are 42 cents a kilowatt hour, solar is already a grid parity. Solar is already a grid parity in a lot of areas in India. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So direct loans up to 18 years, um, our current interest rates based on 1% over comparable maturity treasuries is about 2.96%. No, you can't get a mortgage. I can't get one either, so don't feel bad. Um, but, you know, why, why is that relevant? Well, you know, if you're talking about a market like Brazil, Brazil's an investment grade rated market. So CalPERS could buy Brazil bonds if they wanted to, but the interest rates in Brazil are very high. The average rates that banks charge to customers is probably 25%. And the longest loan you can get is probably three years, and that's only through a development bank. And so interest rates are very high throughout the world. Um, terms are very short. We supported a project in Canada where the banks were only going out eight and a half years. Can you imagine trying to pay a home mortgage off in eight and a half years? No way. So this is not so much different, right? So if you've got an 18-year term, it enables uh, the per unit costs of renewable energy to be, to be much lower. Now, we also provide loan guarantees, and that's 100% full faith and credit guarantee of loans that commercial banks would make to creditworthy buyers and creditworthy projects to buy U.S. made goods and services. Uh, that's another reason that we exist is because basically banks are uh, limited in their ability to make cross-border loans. Every time a bank makes a loan, it has to hold back a little bit of reserve requirements. Um, part of the financial crisis is that those that 
we're doing CDOs, uh, didn't hold back that capital, but that's another discussion we can have. Uh, so banks have to hold back capital, okay? Well, they've gone through a lot of capital in the recent experience, and so if they can make a loan, have it 100% guaranteed by, by Exim Bank, we find a reasonable assurance of repayment, it's a win-win. So we're crowding in private capital, private financing, to support renewable energy. We also have working capital guarantee. So if you're a company like uh, TAS, Turbine Air Systems, a company that Carl Gaywell knows very well, it's an emerging uh, geothermal company, you're in Houston, you go to your bank and you said, listen, great news, I've just got $50 million order from overseas, but I need working capital to build my systems. And the bank looks at them kind of funny, and what, your, your source of repayment's overseas? And again, their ability to take uh, long-term cross-border risk, and so Exxon Bank provides a 90% guarantee to a bank like a Bank of America or Silicon Valley Bank to make that loan to the exporter to support their, their build-up to produce their goods for services. Um, just in case you're wondering, over the past uh, five years, since 2008, we've returned $1.6 billion to the U.S. Treasury, and that's because our, our loss ratio is very, very low. Uh, some might argue too low, um, particularly those of us in business development, but that's Craig's opinion and not for attribution to the bank. But no, we have a very, we have a great loan officer core. And so they do a great job at structuring these loans, and so we do get, we do get repaid. Um, we've really assumed our historic role. When financial markets were under some difficulty, we stepped in. And so when I joined the bank, it's probably, you know, eight, nine billion dollars a year in financing is probably a big year. Um, well, last year, for the third straight year, we broke a record, 35 billion, and that supported 50 billion in exports. Now, this is with the same number of people, so our productivity is really high. Uh, people are working a lot longer and sweating as well, but that's, that's another story. Um, but we're, we're achieving our mandate, um, but we hopeful, hopefully that financial markets will come back to normal. I mean, in the old days, you know, Germany was a big borrower of Exim Bank because they needed it. Well, Germany's economy outgrew Exim Bank, they developed their own savings, and then we focused on other markets. So we're kind of, one of the kind of the sub lines of Exim Bank is we're a lender of last resort in many areas. Um, I like to be the lender of first resort for solar because I, I want to grow this portfolio. In case you're wondering, um, we started the office in 2008, and our growth has really mirrored the growth of the industry. So we had $30 million the first year we started. That's not much. Uh, next year we had 100. Next year after that we had 330 million. Next year, the last two years, our total has been 1.6 billion. So we're demand driven, right? So what I try to do is increase the probability that U.S. made goods and services will be demanded by saying, well, this is a great financing package if you buy U.S. made components. So I'm proud to say that we're probably the number one, number one or number two lender for solar in India. And so that's supporting over $480 million worth of projects. We're probably, um, the Indian government has a national solar mission, so they've committed to get 20,000 megawatts by the year 2022. And so in this first, they've hit their first gigawatt, the first thousand megawatts. We finance probably over 30% of that. Um, and again, b because of the challenge of uh, short bank terms, high interest rates. Um, we financed a pr the first commercial concentrated solar project, CSP project for Arriva. Now Arriva is a, yes, they're a French company, but they bought a linear Fresnel company in Mountain View, California. So that export and the goods and services that go into that export were used in a project in India that's the first CSP. Uh, we financed recently a, a rooftop project in Mexico. $780,000 loan guarantee that we provided to UPS Capital to a business in Mexico for 10 years to buy uh, modules made by Ceneva in Norcross, Georgia. So we don't have a minimum project size either. And so we can either, we very, you know, Echo, uh, uh, Echo Heat Pumps is another one of our customers at uh, very, very uh, small loans. Um, some of the other interesting deals, I've mentioned Gamesa a couple times, so we financed a project in Honduras, the Cerro de Hula project, 18 years, because it's renewable energy, we also support local costs, site preparation, grid connection, up to 30% of the U.S. contract amount. That project, Sarah de Hula, provides 6% of all Honduras' power and does so at a rate that's half the cost of existing cost of generation. Why? Because they're importing bunker fuel. They're importing diesel for generation. Now they've got a 25-year fuel price edge. Um, that project was the largest, is the largest wind project in Central America. We've got a few more as a follow-on. So um, we have our, the, really the entire bank is created to supporting renewable energy. We have my unit that's really business development. Try to, we try to structure the deal so we, they look like they're bankable. 
And then we have a project finance group that they're really experts in their field, and they're really committed. So they've done some of the first independent power projects around the world. Independent power projects means a government agency doesn't own it, right? So it's privately generated, privately financed, privately owned. Maybe a government utility like CFE in Mexico agrees to buy the power. But again, it's crowding in a lot of investment that can be used to uh, support infrastructure development. So this whole idea, you know, it's a policy form. So the whole idea is, um, you know, 2004, you probably had one U.S. wind manufacturer, and that was, that was GE Wind, right? Because of the PTC, now you have probably well over nine uh, uh, wind turbine manufacturers. And these are highway, high, high wage, high skilled jobs. And guess what? You've got this production base in the U.S. Now these guys are ready for export. So the first time I ever met Gamesa, I said, well, you guys are a U.S. company now. Um, they kind of looked at me funny. No, we're Spain. As far as I'm concerned, you're a U.S. company. And think about the customers in the Americas that want to buy U.S.-made goods and services. Nobody can touch Exim Bank in the financing. So we can, we can be very important to you. So follow-on project, uh, one of the first wind projects in Uruguay. Uruguay's government provided special incentives for wind, so we're there. Uh, obviously, we're looking for you know, GE. You know, again, we're demand-driven. Look for a credit-worthy uh, source of repayment. Some of the other projects you may be interested in, um, we financed a rooftop project in Barbados. So our engineer wanted to go inspect the project. We said, no, you don't need to. This technology works. Nice try. So that, that, was, an, that was an individual that did that. It was Williams Industries, and he put solar panels on a recycling facility. Why? Because it, it saved money. Right? I mean, he wasn't necessarily green. The green was, hey, it's going to save me a lot of money, and I've got a fuel price edge. So that was another deal that we did. Um, in the um, geothermal side, we, this is interesting that Carl made the point about geothermal technology and how increasingly it's becoming modular, and it's even you, know, you can use geothermal with lower heat. So we financed a $1.6 million, small, 750 kilowatt uh, project in Turkey. So it was three modular Pratt & Whitney units, and uh, that was a loan guarantee to one of the banks that, that made that possible. So I think I'll stop there. I think I have a few minutes left, right? Um, you're about out of time. Ready to go. So one or two questions. Yes, sir. Right. Please do, because nobody's talked to me about it. So trust me, I'll, t I'll get my teeth into it and won't let go of it. Yeah. And in Brazil, um, their, their grid is completely antiquated. Uh -huh. Development infrastructure is a substantial need. The company, the country is exploding, the middle class is exploding. We're assisting in taking U.S. developers who are sitting on their hands because our development is flat and trying to get them to work inside Brazil. Right. There's substantial difficulties in regards to exporting those goods. I think, well, one, one issue is local content in Brazil. A lot of countries have local content restrictions, and so Brazil is one of those. So we, we finance wind blades. We didn't finance the turbines because Brazilians say, saying that for projects they support, 60% has to be made in Brazil. So that, that's probably one issue. Uh, the other issue is that governments pretty, uh, they jealously guard the electricity sector, so it's hard for new uh, companies to get, get involved in there. But let me tell you, since you brought up Brazil, one of the speakers you're going to hear about in uh, your upcoming sessions is Steve Wilburn. And they, it's a company Firm Green, and they had a project that captured the methane gas that came off of one of the world's largest landfills in Rio de Janeiro, the Novo Gramacho landfill. In fact, there was a documentary film that was made about it. And so they were selling, the, they were cleaning the gas, they were selling the gas to Petrobras, which is a state oil and gas company, uh, for use in their facility. And so we provided a 12-year direct loan, and that project was our uh, uh, project of the year this past year. So that's a project we're very proud of. Firm Green's a small company. Um, they have the proprietary technology. They, this, is, this is good use of outsourcing. So they use, they outsource manufacturing of the systems to various, you know, metal shops all throughout the U.S. Midwest. And obviously they're hoping to, to replicate that. So. Yeah, great question. I mean, for the bank as a whole, it's in the thousands. 
Um, for renewable energy, it's probably, it's probably uh, firms that we know, um, probably less than 100. But, I mean, you look at the solar manufacturers in the U.S., and you could probably count them on one or two hands, win one or two hands. So, again, we, we hope that more companies will get engaged. And, look, companies are born global. It's not like all of a sudden you, know, you develop this market and you're just going to sell to the United States. You've got to think immediately about global resources. Department of Commerce has a, has a system to help you find a distributor. They'll do a, a customized market search for you. you know, they'll help you with your issue about market access. We've got the financing both for the international customer as well as the U.S. company to get ramped up. So there's no, and I tell you, a lot of the venture capitalists, and we're, we're locked in with some of those, basically the pitch is send us your, your new companies and this is how we can help them export. Uh, they're born global. And the VCs will ask right away, it's like, okay, what's your plan for going global? And there's, there's no, we've got great technology in the United States. A lot of it's uh, automated, a great place to manufacture. I don't have to tell you that. If the policies are right and you, and you get an industry like we have with solar, like we have with wind, that's an industry that can go global and be successful. Financing is a key part of that. We hope to keep growing with the industry. So thanks a lot and look forward to hearing from you. Great. Super. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Danielson is going to be speaking now in the caucus room, but I want to just say a special thank you to Craig. I think that it was great that you were here today um, because I think that we are really on the cusp and that this is a very, very exciting time. Uh, we are looking at renewables exploding across the world in terms of thinking about market. The opportunities are endless. The new technology and companies are so fascinating with many, many terrific stories. And so we really look to follow up with you, Craig, because we think this is such an important piece of everything that's going on. So thank you very, very much for being here.